Hello everybody, it is Ebontis, and in this video, my goal is to give you guys tips that hopefully will make your journey through Starfield a little less bumpy. Uh, I'm not going to go deep on things like shipbuilding or outposts. That is a, that's a whole 30 minute video guide. That, those are big. These are going to be a bunch of little tips for small situations, um, skills that I found very useful, why I found those useful, things that are going to improve your quality of life in the game, and just some things that hopefully will give your journey a bit more of a smoother ride through a game that I enjoyed my experience from, but my beginning many hours were rather bumpy. So if you enjoy this one, hopefully you'll learn something from it. And when we get to the end of this, if you really enjoy the content, hopefully I'll see you back here on the channel. But let's jump in to a lot of tips that hopefully are going to smooth out your journey through Starfield. One of the first big tips that I want to cover is fast travel. It's extremely useful. So if I had run halfway across this dusty desert and I wanted to get back to my ship, I could bring up whether it's my scanner and I can see it, whether I'm on the surface map and I want to see it. I can just go right back to my ship and I would fast travel straight there. But you can go even farther than that. If you have been somewhere before and you are not in a specifically instanced area, which would be like a couple nightclubs I've been in, maybe in one or two mission areas. Not very often though. Most times if you have been somewhere, even you know, systems away. If I want to go back to this system here and maybe I want to go to, oh, let's see, Mars, for example, and I want to go to this planet. I could literally just go there and land and it would be skipping the get on the ship, go back to orbit, fly to orbit, land, and I would be straight there. Now, if you're carrying contraband, which is stuff that you'll get scanned for, it won't let you do that. But as long as you've been somewhere, you 100% percent can skip over a whole lot of the steps of getting on the ship going to orbit and all that and fast travel will save you a lot of time if you're down in a cave and you want to just fast travel to your ship real quick you'll pretty much warp right out of there so fast travel is a very very good quality of life thing and if you think you might be able to fast travel somewhere you probably can so the next thing to talk about is your kind of guidance arrows that you've got and i'm going to do the, a lot of this on this dusty planet so sorry it's going to look a little drab but the whole point is to avoid spoilers where i can so if I've got a certain quest and did not expect that one, <laughs> landmines. But if I've got a quest and the first step means that I need to get back on my ship, what you can do is if you've got a quest marker telling you to head back to your ship or to head to a certain person's office or head to a different floor or whatever it may be, you can use your scanner tool. And if you look on the ground, you're going to see arrows that guide you where you need to go. So you can actually see the path along the ground that right now it's like, hey, you need to get off the ship and go somewhere else. So it's just telling me to go on my ship. If I'm in a city that's very dense and there's a lot of locations, I can almost get lost. As long as you've got some type of quest, and this will help you get where you're going. So this will save you a lot of time. And again, if the arrows go away, put your scanner away, bring it back out, and they will show back up again. So depending on if you're going on a, like a long trip or something like that, you might have to pull it out again. But... The scanner and the arrows have saved me more times than I can honestly count. So make sure you use this thing because there are certain times where you need to maybe need to get somewhere quickly, for example. And it is very beneficial to know where you're going and not get lost in some of these maze and corridors and different structures that you're going to be in. So use your scanner, use the arrows, very beneficial. Similar to fast travel, um, there is a difference of if you've been somewhere before and if you have not. Now, if you're trying to jump across the solar system and go to planets that you haven't been to before, you're going to see the path that you have to jump to. And you'll notice I can jump to probably here. And that's going to cover quite a few different destinations. Now, you'll notice when you go to jump, you've got a couple limitations. One is going to be your fuel consumption. And I will show you a little later in the video one of the earliest and kind of only real ship upgrades that I would recommend early on to kind of help as you're jumping around and doing a bunch of quests because if every time you have to go from here to here and you do want to make that jump that may not be that far but then when you get to certain destinations and you want to go a little bit farther and if you want to make that jump your base fuel capacity is 50. I just upgraded the fuel tank up to 160 one of the best upgrades I ever did and I'll show you guys where that's at but also, if you're going to a new destination, I could travel all the way to here, the destination I have been to, but then I would have to stop there in orbit and then make the trip to the next step. If I'm going on two steps, I could make it to here, then I would have to travel from this destination to this one, 
Then once you're in orbit, you could go from this destination to this one. So if you're going to a new place, you're going to have to go through each step. But if you have a big enough fuel tank and you want to go all the way back, like say I do want to go to the Dakarian system and say my fuel is big enough, so I probably can't go that far, but say I'm here and maybe my fuel has enough to make the jump all the way back, you can skip all of those steps. That's why one, a few big fuel tank for grav jumps is very helpful. And then two, once you've gone places, coming back is much, much easier. All right, so when you're in space, you're gonna have different things that you can interact with. Whether you blew up a ship and it had a little bit of cargo, whether you're going to be interacting with space stations and other things, whether you wanna board it, you immobilize the ship and you wanna board it. All of that stuff is going to interact at a certain distance. So if you wanna target something, you're gonna use your targeting and you can lock onto them. But when you get within 500 meters, that's when you're gonna be able to have the option to dock and or pick up the you know debris pick up the stuff like that so 500 meters is your magical distance so if you're like boosting in on somebody and then you do want to dock 500 meters is when that pops up so you don't go crashing into the ship so remember that's the distance you need to be able to interact with things in space is about that far away hopefully that helps and just keep that in the back of your mind all right, there are no maps that are related to cities, which I promise you, I kind of wish there was, and I'm sure some modders are gonna put some random stuff like that in. But for now, the maps that you have are gonna be your surface map, which you can access depending on if you're on a planet, but as well if you bring up your scanner, you can go to the surface map, and that's gonna show you kind of a general stuff that's around you. And again, this is your basic planet surfaces. You'll have your bespoke items, which are like the abandoned mine, which you can see from the surface. And then each time you land, it's gonna generate a few things like a natural structure, Maybe it's a big mountain range. Maybe it's a big, like, mining geode. Who knows? And you've also got random structures you can go to. The abandoned mines, the, you know, deserted barracks, that type of stuff, probably going to have a little more things that are valuable in there, like resources and ammo and other things of that nature. Maybe a decent amount of enemies that you can fight. The random structure that is just, like, part of the procedural generation, a little more hit or miss on what you're going to find out there. So sometimes you'll find things, and a lot more of this is going to be resource-based in what you do. Um, but overall, I would say the bespoke ones are a little more valuable. Then, if you go to your actual map and you pick your planet, then this is what a map is going to look like. You can show resources so you can see where it's at. So if you want to land near uranium, you can land in this area if you specifically want to. You can literally travel to that specific spot instead of that landing area. Maybe I'm looking for lead and you're looking for a lot of resources. This is where this is going to come into play. And then if you bring it out again, we're going to go to the system level. You can actually see the gravity of the star and the planets. And here's where you're going to see if a destination has some of that stuff that's worthwhile. You take like this Holly, for example. It's a moon around this planet. It does have an autonomous dog star factory. I don't even... That is probably some reference to something, but it's not anything that I'm going to remember what it is off the top of my head right now. But that is a facility that you would be able to go in. Probably has multi-levels. A lot more stuff to explore than just coming back to this side of the planet. And then once you fly there, you can just go to the back side. And you can't scan a destination until you actually get there. There's an upgrade. If I travel to like a main planet like this, I can actually scan all of the moons. That's one of the skills you can get. Might save you a little time. Depends on how much if you're surveying and doing those types of things. But these little three dots that you see on everything means there's something unique there. And again, if it's got a big little bit of a structure on it, you can see that that thing means there's a city a pretty good sized structure on it. Any of those you can actually see. These, when you get out to, to your, excuse me, big star map, is going to be like, this is an outpost icon. If you've built outposts, if you know places that have cities, they're going to have these icons. So your main points are going to have those above them. If you've built outposts, you'll see which systems they are. But that's kind of the tiers of your levels of maps that you can go through. So, you know, use them where you can. But remember, fast travel a lot of places. You can cover a lot of ground very quickly. Sorry, I try not to show you anything spoilery. Um, yeah, the different maps, some are better than others. There definitely could be improvements on maps as well, though. Okay, there are a couple skills that I want to talk about that are going to make some quality of life improvements if you lean into them. As I said, on some of these planets, you're just going to have to go for a bit of a jog. I got to go almost half a kilometer if I want to go check out what this structure is over here. So I got to go running. Now you'll notice in the bottom left hand corner, I'm using up my oxygen supply. When I jump, I don't use my oxygen supply. When I use my boost pack, depending on how much gravity there is, 
And I'm also still flying in the air, so I'm not using up that oxygen supply. Now, the reason the oxygen supply is so crucial, and again, a planet that has less gravity, you use a little less oxygen. Planet with more gravity, it's gonna go a little bit quicker. But as you use your oxygen, when you are out of oxygen, then you're gonna start building up CO2. And if you hit the max, it's gonna hurt you a little bit, take a little bit of your health off, and then it's also going to um, take a little while to recover. So now I'm in the CO2 buildup mode. And then if I keep running, and again, you're not doing anything too bad yet, but if the CO2 fills all the way up, you're gonna take a chunk of your health up and then it's gonna kind of stun you like that. And then you'll be kind of in a slow walk. Now, when you're walking in normal status, even walking, you will refill your oxygen and you could walk without ever using up oxygen. But you'll notice if you jump, but I'm definitely not using anything up, but I can cover a little bit more ground. That's why the boost pack is very nice, because if you start for a run, you're using up some oxygen, but you carry that momentum into your boosts. And then I'm just hovering above the ground with a few of these boosts that you can find, packs that function in different way. But especially on a planet with like low gravity, I could bounce like this for a long time and not use up any oxygen. So it's a way to be able to allow you to cover more ground if you've got a bit of a farther run to go. Like, if I want to go to something that's a kilometer away, that's a bit of a trek. So making these pieces better, there are ways to do that, and it's all in the skills. So let me show you. So, specifically related to traveling around, you've got three things that are going to make a difference. One is going to be weightlifting. Now, weightlifting is going to increase your carrying capacity. Now, this is something, depending on how much of stuff in these Bethesda games you want to pick up, if you want to pick up a bunch of weapons, if you want to have a bunch of spacesuit options, if you just want to find a cool, a bunch of cool things and not be quite as limited by your inventory space, this is definitely a way to do it. So it was one of those because encumbrance is a real pain. And when we get back to running around, I'll show you why that's an issue. Um, but the main issue is like, I didn't want to deal with it as much. So I boosted it up by 100 kilograms. Like 10 doesn't feel that much, but when you get down to rank four and really level this thing up, it does make a drastic difference. It goes from 140 to 240. So you really do start feeling it when you get to tier four on some of these skills. So that's going to help you carry more and also avoid being over encumbered. And I'll explain what that is here in a second. If you want to go into fitness, now the oxygen available depends on how much you're running and how much you're like doing stuff physically and running around. If you get down to tier four, sprinting and power attacks, which you can do some like melee attacks that use oxygen and stuff like that. You can actually have those use less, significantly less oxygen. So then sprinting would be less of an issue. Um, now, if you went heavy on fitness, you might be able to avoid using your boost pack at all. If you're one of those people who just, maybe it's a challenge. Some people do it without a boost pack. You'd probably have to go into fitness. And you'll notice that's kind of why I didn't go that deep on fitness in my playthrough is because of my boost pack training. One, if you want to use boost packs at all, you got to pick the skill. And if you pick a skill, getting down into tier four really does make a difference. So I'm at the point where it uses less fuel. And then if I completed the previous one, when I have a skill point, I'll be able to have it generate more quickly in return. And then when you get to rank four, both of those are doubled. So it really makes your running around on planets, even with like kind of heavier gravity, much more manageable. Because again, you wouldn't be using oxygen as you boost through the air. And then also, sometimes you just want to jump up to the second level of the building or a balcony to go directly after an enemy or something. For me, the boost pack was like, a must. I mean, it probably won't be for everyone, but I can tell you it really makes the early travel before you get some of these skills up and stuff like that a little bit more manageable. Now, the other thing is being over encumbered. Currently, my mass is 104 of 240. But again, remember, if I didn't have the weightlifting, that would be 140. So I wouldn't take too long because you've got weapons that can, um, if I sort through, you can see like their mass. So I mean, one weapon is like five pounds. If you get quite a few cool weapons, you're not entirely sure which one you want to pick. If you start running out of inventory space, then you find another spacesuit. That thing weighs nine pounds. And then I got a jetpack that weighs six pounds and a helmet that weighs like three pounds. If you find a couple different sets of those things and you're trying to see which one you want to use, all of a sudden you're full. Kind of gets to be a little annoying. You know, some stuff is going to be pretty light. Like each one of these outfits are about a pound. Um, you know, your grenades and things, they're, you know, half to a third of a pound. They're not that much. But if all of a sudden you have 16 grenades, you know, that's going to add up a little bit here and there. Everything does just start adding up. So having more freedom in your encumbrance is very, very helpful. But then also, right now when I'm walking, you'll see that I'm not using oxygen. 
if you have like my mass capacity is 240 if i if my inventory was at 241 of 240 i am over encumbered and even just normal walking would be using up oxygen and you get to a point where just moving around to recover your oxygen you would have to just stop moving which is just an awful situation if you have like you got a bunch of cool stuff you don't really want to get rid of it right now but you just want to get back to your ship one you cannot fast travel when you're over encumbered so that is a really big pain in the butt so then you either just got to drop some stuff or two you got to run a little bit and then wait for it to come back and then run a little bit and then try and get your air back i did it one time it was an absolute pain in the butt and that is why i specced into the things i did so i never really had to deal with it again so that is why managing your inventory, but also having a lot more freedom in your inventory weight that you can carry made things a lot better. Being over encumbered sucked. Now, I will say one nice thing is your ammo. Now, your ammo literally weighs nothing. Now, I don't know if realistically that makes sense, but in the game, all of the ammo, no however many bullets or shells or fuses or rounds or cartridges, they have no mass to them. So all the little bit of exploring that you do, whether it's an abandoned mind or a bunker or you, just a chest that you're going to open, if there's any point that you can pick up ammo, do it. Because I have a thousand ra like laser rounds and it hurts me n in no way. I can hold as many as I've got. I'm sure there's a max like 9999 or something crazy. But again, ammo weighs nothing. So if you see it, even if you have a gun that doesn't use it, pick it up everywhere that is why for me like i explored a pretty good amount which you know i spent 80 hours and i probably could have used it more efficiently but i can tell you i never had an ammo issue never had to make sure i was running around and buying ammo because i was i found enough different weapons i could try and what you can do is you can go to your weapons and you can switch and see what ammo they actually use so if you're curious and be like all right i got these three weapons Maybe you do need to go buy ammo. You can actually go check and see I need 43 Ultra Mag, 50 Cal, and 7 Millimeter. And that way, at least you don't have to, like, try and hunt through the weapon, see what it uses. You can just kind of make a quick list, maybe take a quick screenshot, and then go to a vendor. But honestly, if you're running around, exploring, checking an office space, opening a cabinet, you know, seeing ammo glowing things that sit on the ground, pick all of the ammo up and keep it because there's no reason not to pick every piece of ammo up that you see. It doesn't hurt you at all. Now, the other thing is you're going to have companions that come with you. Some of them are going to have story-related beats. Uh, one, there's a robot companion that's kind of always hanging out by the exit of your ship, unless you ask him to follow you. And some are companions that are just going to be for combat or for space stats, whatever you want to call it. But the nice thing is if you talk to them, you're able to trade with them. And for one, you can give them different stuff. So I give them, if I want to give her an Equinox rifle and then maybe a calibrated pistol, maybe I can give her a certain space suit. You can kind of help their gear a little bit, but you also notice their mass is 7 of 35. So if I go into my inventory and I want to trade, you know, 10 of these grenades over there, I can definitely do that. And you can pick how many you want to trade, send them over, and now she's holding on to some of the grenades. I've got a little less weight in my inventory. And if you're doing that with a bunch of weapons and spacesuits, and if you start getting into resources where you've got, like, minerals that start weighing a lot and stuff like that it's really going to be a beneficial thing so don't forget that all of your companions can kind of work like mules that can help you hold a bit more storage especially the ones running around with you down in an abandoned mine if you're like i really want to pick this thing up but i'm kind of full you know see if your companion still has space and then just make sure you might need to clean them out at a later date but they are very helpful for that and there's been certain combat um certain combat encounters depending on what companion is with you if you've got one that's good at like rifles and sharpshooting and accuracy they may sit back and snipe and pick people off and you've got a really helpful companion while you get up close and personal so it may help kind of complement your st play styles with companions too but the sharing of like the weight of inventory very very helpful now another thing you're gonna have to set up on your own it's your favorites when you have so many different weapons that will come through your inventory i mean depending on how much you're holding and how many different weapon varieties you like you might have 10 different weapons so you're going to have to set up your favorites and your hotkeys. So like weapon two is going to be this pistol. Weapon three is going to be my machine gun. Weapon four is going to be my lawgiver. Those I have to set up. Also, when it comes to meds, which I'll talk about in a second, you can set up those for hotkeys. You can set up your throwable things like a grenade and then a different grenade. And there's probably a couple other things that you can slot in here as well, but you have to pick them. Otherwise, what you're going to have to do is if I want to use this weapon, and then you haven't set something up as a favorite. You got to come back in here, switch over, equip that one. And then when you come back out, then you can use it. Or you can just set it up as a favorite and switch on the fly. 
you can't like scroll through them to my understanding because that'll change my like first and third person perspective but at least i know i can switch because i've got them set up so setting up your favorites as you you know you get a few new weapons take a second set up your favorites freshen it up again and you're good to go for a while so favorites definitely helpful and speaking of favorites, that comes to your aid category. And that is going to be everything from something you can eat that will give you some health back. Um, you can have extra things besides just getting health. Uh, you've got the ability to amps are nice because those are something where you can have faster movement speed, double the jump height. Uh, you've also got things that are going to help with ailments. So you can see this one is going to treat burns, constitutions, frostbite, infections, lacerations, and puncture wounds. So you'll see the treatments up here is like I've got the the three like drops is going to be kind of a burn or frostbite. Then you've got the bandages, which is going to be like bleeding and wounds. Then you've got also infections and things of that nature. You've also got a couple other. You've got one here that's more of like a lung injection. And especially when you're dealing with your oxygen supply and things like that, it can get a little bit limiting. Whether if you've got lung damage, then you can't run as far. And if you've got other damage, your health bar might not be full. So clearing those ailments that actually stick on you from whether it's a big fall and you don't quite catch yourself or something happens and you're out in an extreme environment and you get frostbite, you're going to want to clear those. So this is another thing. These don't tend to weigh that much. Uh, there's certain things that don't weigh anything at all, like med packs. They weigh zero. These are one of the main ways that you're going to heal yourself. Um, and they weigh nothing. So, again, if you see med packs, pick them all up. Trauma kits and emergency kits, they weigh a little bit, but they're worth it. Now, you can see this one is like a mochi multi-pack. It's just going to restore eight health, but it also weighs a pound and a half. Now, it's nice to have a little bit of health that I can get back by literally just, like, eating some ramen. Get four health back. Sometimes I'll pick this stuff up but just, like, have it on me. So, if I want to sit there and eat a few things and get some health back, I can do that. But if you're not so worried about those... I would still make sure you're picking up anything that's like going to help with ailments because usually they're not that heavy and two, having a good mix of them, like it's snake oil, which sounds hilarious, but it's going to help me with my brain injury, concussion, stroke, lung damage, all that type of stuff. It's always good to have a mix and there's something called like panacea. If you ever see those, it literally cures everything. Um, now it drains all of your oxygen, so you're going to have to chill there for a second, but it's going to clear all your ailments. So those are a nice thing to pick up. So you can get some nice benefits from these as well. If you get to some of the, you know, less than uh, kid-friendly products, you can get to like Chardonnay. You have less oxygen recovery, but if you're working on some quests and you need a little persuasion boost, that might be something that otherwise you might not really win a con like be able to win the persuasion conversation. This little 9% boost may help you out. So a lot of your aid stuff has some interesting things to it. So if you see all those types of items, massive amount of damage resistance. That can be pretty helpful at times. So there's some really cool stuff to like alien genetic material. I don't even know where I found this stuff, but damage resistance and energy resistance for just a minute of time. If you're getting, if you're like you save before something and then you have a crazy fight to do and you pop a few of these into like favorites and you can use them right in the middle of a fight, that may help you survive something you might have otherwise died from. So aid, very helpful. Set up a few like, you know, your basic heal packs and stuff for favorites. And then if you've got a couple other fun ones, like you get a good, good supply of amps, you want faster movement and jumps. If you're going to do a whole bunch of running around planets, here you go. Nice benefits from them. So have a variety of aids that will help you with a lot of ailments. And, you know, if you go to a medical doctor and you can buy medical supplies, make sure you get a good variety. They're usually not that expensive once you start getting a decent amount of money and keep yourself stocked up on these. But also the exploration, opening chests and bunkers and cabinets and finding these all over the place, they're worth picking up. They don't weigh much and they're worth the, worth the inventory space more often than not. Now, another thing in your inventory is going to be your suits. Now, if I'm running around on a hostile planet where there's not a lot of oxygen, obviously I need a spacesuit. No real question about that. But if I'm just running around inside of a city, what you can do is if you go into your spacesuits inventory, see down here where it says show spacesuit in settlements, or you can actually hide spacesuits in settlements. So when you're running around, you're just running around in your clothes and if you're having, you know, discussions and stuff, you'll look a little ridiculous. And sometimes people are like, you don't need a spacesuit in here. You're like, well, I just kind of have to have it on. You can hide the spacesuits and helmet in breathable areas. And now you don't kind of look and look as ridiculous. And it's just a cosmetic thing. It's still going to be functional when you're outside. But if you're indoors, 
it'll be just a little reasonable. The pack, you're not ever going to hide. It's just going to be there. But it's the spacesuit and the helmets. Hide them in those environments. Just going to make things a little more reasonable. When you're walking inside a city and normal people are there and you're in a funky-looking spacesuit, you look a little out of place. Now, I will cover shipbuilding a little bit more when we actually get back because there's one main thing I want to show you is the helium tanks that I talked about when it comes to traveling around space. But if shipbuilding is something you are interested in, two things you want to focus on for skills. Piloting. This allows you to use thrusters and have a bit more maneuverability in combat and that stuff. But also it allows you to pilot higher class ships. And it also allows you when you are getting into the upgrading later on in the game. Because it's not something I recommend getting into early. But a later game when you have more money and you have access. Sometimes there are ships that just land on planets by the way. You could walk over and just hide, hijack that ship depending on if you're stealth enough to do it. You can get inside, take out the crew. But I've actually had a point where I did that. I got all the way inside, literally to the pilot seat, and I am alone in there. But the ship is too high of a class, and I could not pilot it. That was really, really annoying. The other side is starship design. If you want to mess around with starship design, you are going to want this as well. It allows you to get all the cool modules, cutting edge, experimental. Um, depending on where you're building your ship, you have access to different parts. But there's a lot of stuff you won't have access to if you don't go deep in starship design. So if this is something you're going to lean into... Those are the two main things related to starship design. And as I kind of really like tinkering with the ships, this is stuff that I leaned into or leaned into. If you want to get into crafting, you're going to have spacesuit design and weapon engineering and that type of stuff. If you want to mess with outposts and resources, you've got outpost engineering and planetary habitation. So you can actually put outposts on extreme planets. Skills are something that like the couple that I mentioned earlier for like the weightlifting and the boost pack, just for general quality of life, that's fine. But I highly recommend, before you start putting your skills places, reading through all these and figure out how do you want your playthrough to be, because it is really going to be what role you play. Are you going to be a science outpost guy? It's going to be kind of hard to go all the way down to planetary habitation, the amount of time it takes to get down to that skill level and really max it out. It's going to take even longer if you do the, app, the, hap, the outposts first, and then you want to get into ships. You're going to have a lot of leveling due to get there. So you're going to want to kind of plan out the things that you want to focus on. Like, I really wanted combat. I leveled this thing out max, and I've got 30% weapon damage across the board, and I boosted my range when, on my later save that I have for my review. But if you really want to just mess around with combat and go everywhere that you can fight, you could probably be a beast, but then you're going to be giving up other things. I wanted persuasion. I leaned into that pretty hard. Um, intimidation, isolation, you've got negotiation, you've got diplomacy, currency, a lot of different options here if you want to have fun with all the dialogue options. If you don't have those selected, you're probably not going to have those options. So really take a second because you cannot reset your skills. Even when you do New Game Plus, your skills that you've got allocated carry forward with you, which is not a bad thing. But if you're really looking to play in a certain style, you're going to need to think through because if you just like sprinkle your points all over the place and you're like level one, one in all of these top things, you're not going to be getting a lot of those benefits that tier four gives. And you're also just going to be spread th so thin, it's going to be really hard to get down to these lower tiers. So just take some time in your initial playthrough, look through the skills, see what sounds appealing to you, and you kind of do have to commit. And again, if you don't really love how things go... There's enough choices that you can make in this game. Second playthroughs for some people are going to be just their second of many playthroughs, I would imagine. Now, this one, I'm just going to have to show you a picture on screen. And I think there's one of these in the Constellation headquarters, so you'll probably bump into it. I have seen like two, maybe three of these other ones in like 80 hours. Now, there's going to be guides out there probably showing where all of these are. And I recommend using those because I happened upon a couple of these little magazine articles or whatever they are, they're random pickups that I've seen just a few in all of my hours of playing, but they give you a permanent little boost. So I'm sure there's going to be a guide out there. And the other thing is if you're looking for those kind of, if you're like going to places, if you go to a random planet in a random system and you're like, oh, I wonder if this destination is going to allow me to find one of these random pages. If you go to a destination and it has the three dots on it, you'll notice that it's going to have a bespoke structure like the abandoned pharmaceuticals lab. That's going to have, that is a structure that has been made and somewhat curated by Bethesda. But if you just go to a planet that has no bespoke structures on it, you can land and then you're going to see those like random 
structures and natural things and geological things, but it's, that's all the procedure generated stuff. When it comes to some of those like pickups, like rare magazine articles, those are going to be in the bespoke sections, not the completely random procedural generations that you're going to be doing. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're looking for them. But my recommendation, wait for a guide because I saw so few, you would probably go crazy trying to find those things. I think it's just going to be a collaborative effort. Like if you find one, somebody's probably going to start making a post about it and be like, where'd you find it? Where was it? And it's just going to be a team effort because I bumped into a couple and I may have walked over a hundred and not even know it. So they're just, they're random finds in all of my exploration. Now, another thing in your inventory that you can do is actually check out your ship. Now, that's just from your main character screen. You can just click on your ship, and it's going to bring you in here. So you can look at your ship, kind of check out the parts. You can't do any building with it, um, but you can also see what's in your cargo hold if you're curious about that. But another thing you can do is you can check your crew. And there's different people I've met. I can see the benefits they have, and currently they're unassigned. But if I want to assign them to them, crew from any location be, be assigned to the landing ship. So for some reason, you may have lost a character somehow. That sounds weird, but trust me, it's actually possible. Feel like you lost somebody, assign them to your ship, and then you can actually probably bring them to you quicker than trying to remember where you may have dumped somebody off on accident or told somebody to wait. So feel like you missed someplace, somebody, here's a good way to track them down, but also this is for like outposts and other things. If you need to assign somebody somewhere, this is where you find them. Another thing to mention is saving. The game will auto save a lot. Anytime you go through a loading screen, you will save. And you're gonna be going through a lot of loading screens, I will tell you, it's just the way the game is designed. But there's also times like if I'm running around here on this planet's surface and I go and run over here and explore this thing and then I run down here and explore this thing and I'm still on the surface and I haven't actually gone through really a door to have a save system happen, you might want to just save it. If you think it's been a while since you went through a door or a loading screen, it might be worth a save. But you'll notice if I just like board my ship, it's going to auto save right there. And then if I leave, it's going to auto save. If you go inside a building and it has a small loading screen, it will auto save. So the saves are good. And you can even come out here to see settings, gameplay, on rest, on wait, on travel, on pause. All of those are going to be there. But I'm also just going to say every so often you should probably save. Mostly because there's no reason not to. And some people be like, hey, I messed something up pretty drastically. Just go back to a save that you had before and then you should be okay. Because whether it's a combat encounter that gets kind of brutal, maybe you need to set your inventory up a little different. Or maybe you go into a dialogue and you make different choices than you may, you know, thought have been a good idea. You want to try that again. Save often. There's no reason not to. So definitely, I mean, I'm not saying some people are like, oh, your save's coming or I don't care. Save often. It is going to be in your benefit. You could always back up if something goes wrong. It's not that big of a deal. Just save often. The game does it a lot. But if you're in, say, a big structure, like if I go in that abandoned mine and I'm running around in that entire structure and it's just one big open area of different floors and levels and it's all just a connected cave and maybe I'm three quarters of the way through it, and then I see a really, like, a big group of enemies, before I start that encounter, save real quick. Because then if something happens or your power goes out, that three quarters of the mine that you did clear out, that's still saved. But since it's an open area, that auto save won't happen. So that's just one of those instances where sometimes it doesn't hurt to save a little more often than you think you might need to. All right, so typically at every spaceport, you're going to have two things kind of close to where your ship lands. By the way, I love how the ships look, like the scale of the ships when you land. They're kind of awesome. But um, <laughs> raving about some things about this aside, you're going to have a ship that? services technician and usually a little trade authority kiosk. Now, this is where you can just sell random stuff you pick up. You got a couple too many weapons. You want to sell something. You always have to have your cutter, by the way. Don't chunk that. You're like, I got four more weapons, but... I don't really love three of them, so here you can come in and sell them. Or you got a uh, couple spacesuits that are kind of generic, you can sell them for a little while. You'll get to a point where you have enough money, you don't pick up as much stuff to sell. And a lot of the value of things, not nearly as high as it shows. Like if I come in here to sell something, it's like 5000 But if I go to my inventory and I go to sell that spacesuit, it's going to be a little bit more because it says the value of it is like 4400 but then when I go to sell the item actually at the kiosk, you saw it was like 500. So the value of things, don't trust that that statue that says it's worth like 500. And early on, you're like, oh, I could pick up a few of those and sell them. They're worth like 20 bucks. But you also notice in the upper right hand corner, it says vendor credits. Some of the things that you pick up, say like contraband and stuff like that, that you can sell. If you, you wouldn't sell contraband here, it would be 
you would be scanned in orbit and then you'd be taken to jail and that's a whole different thing. You'll probably have some fun figuring out. But the vendor credits will run out. So if you get to a point where you pick up like three or four spacesuits and you got like five or six weapons and you got some resources that you want to sell off and all these other things, and then all of a sudden it's going to tell you if you want to sell something, especially like contraband, if you get to a point where you can sell it and it's expensive and maybe you sell like two or three pieces of contraband that are worth like two or three thousand, that third piece, you're not going to get full value and you sell anything else. The vendor will take it off your hands, but it will give you zero dollars for it. So keep in mind how much you sell up to a vendor because the, when that pop up happens, they're broke. So if you have a lot of stuff to dump off, you might have to spread it out between different trips. So that's also why, like, picking up stuff like aid that's valuable and ammo that you're not going to run out of space for, nothing wrong with doing that. But having 17 spacesuits that you think you're going to dump off for a few dollars, maybe. But if you have things that are valuable later on in the game, the vendors are not going to do you a whole lot of benefit. So watch the vendor credits. They can't actually be broken, then you're getting nothing for what you sell them. Now, the other thing is over here at the ship services guy. So when you talk to him, you can do a couple things. If you go through a space battle and you survive it, but maybe you're a little hurt, you can do one of two things. You can either repair your ship, which does, if you have repair parts in your inventory, or ship parts, sorry, you can actually repair it on the fly, like even in the middle of combat. So if you can find ship parts somewhere, they are worth picking up and then putting in the cargo hold because, you know, healing in the middle of battle may be actually what saves you. But the other thing is, if you make it through a battle, don't use your ship parts just to heal. If you're done with combat, go to a port that, you know, is going to have one of these technicians and pay the thousand credits to repair because the ship parts are way more valuable to be able to use in the middle of combat. So don't sleep on this. Use it every so often. If you go through combat, repair and then go back. But the other thing is to modify your ships. Sure. Now, this is not going to be a full how to build your ship. That is a video all in and of itself. But the one thing I mentioned was when it comes to space travel, the distance you travel is gonna be based on your helium tank. Now my helium tank currently sits right over here. You can take the part off and look at it. So this thing has a gravity jump fuel of a 160. When you start this game, your, grav your fuel tank is this guy. It is a grav jump fuel of 50. It is not hard to jump farther than 50. But if you can get to a point where you can get this guy on there, 160 will let you travel much, much farther. Now, depending on where you start, your basic ship is only going to have so many options. It's not going to look like this with these big cargo holds and stuff like that in my ship that I have now. I have a lot more money to toy around with. Ship building is a much later game thing, I recommend. You can toy with a few things, but between balancing gear, then if you put more cargo on, then you got to have stronger engines. And then if you have stronger engines, then you may have made too, maybe too much weight and then you need to balance things out. Shipbuilding is very complicated. But one of those things that will really, really make a difference in your travels is your tank is going to allow you to fly much farther around. So like if you travel four planets out and then you want to come right back to New Atlantis, maybe your tank would actually let you do that if you had a big enough one. And the mass up different upgrade difference is like 10 to 21. You might literally need to take one of your engines off and bump it up just a little bit. It's so like if your first engine is, say, maybe the White Dwarf 2000. I think that might be what your ship starts with. And if one of your ships you bump up to a 2010, it's going to give you a little more thrust, a little more engine health, and just enough to probably be able to serve, like get around with that new part on. But if you start adding like 12 different weapons and massive cargo holds, then you got to go through the whole process of building. Now, the nice thing is if something's broken or, you know, something isn't working, if you back out, you have the option to always cancel the modifications before accepting them and just go right back where you were. But that helium tank, not going to be too drastic of an upgrade. And if you need to bump up your um, engine just a little bit, even one engine, it can be slightly out of balance. It's not going to have to be perfect. And that way you're going to be able to jump farther if you're doing a lot of questing that involves going out to planets and coming back and going out to planets and coming back. Especially depending on how far away some of that stuff is, fuel tank will be big. Uh, Shipbuilding will take a lot of tinkering, trial and error. You've got like weight balancing and systems and gravity drives. Then you've got a reactor to power all these different parts that you have and weapons need assigned. There is a lot to these systems. So if you feel a little bit frustrated... Um, and you are interested in a shipbuilding tutorial, I wouldn't mind putting one of those together because I've got enough money as late as I am into the game that I can sit in this screen for like an hour just messing around with stuff. So you can have fun in here, but this is more later game stuff, I promise you. Small things like a fuel tank and, you know, enough of an engine to manage it, and then maybe a little bigger cargo hold and enough engines to manage that. That's about as much as I would do for especially anything mid to early game anything beyond that it's going to get really cost prohibitive 
and just kind of be a bit of a mess. So helium tank, worth the upgrade though pretty early on. Now my ship's right over there and I know where these two little kiosks are, but usually they're either gonna be near a bar or kind of near a port. Um, they're usually something to pay attention to. You got a mission board, which is gonna be like different bounties that you can do by like hunt down a ship or go do this thing or whatever it may be. And different also factions will have missions. But you've also got the bounty clearance self-service board. Now, if you get a bounty by doing something stupid, you can clear it. The thing to know is uh, our records indicate that you have you are not wanted by any faction within the settled systems. I'm clean right now. But the thing is, if you do want to clear a bounty, you can't go to a system where that bounty is. So this is a system that is faction UC colonies. And then if I go up to another system, you can see UC colonies, Freestar Collective. That's another faction. If I have a bounty in the Freestar Collective, I can't clear that one there. But if I have a Freestar Collective bounty, I can clear it down here at this kiosk. So if you do have a bounty, you're probably going to want to go to a different system to clear it. And then you should be good. It's just going to take you some money. As long as you didn't like go through and wipe out half of a town, your bounty shouldn't be too terrible if you did like little stuff. But if you went through and did something very, very drastic, it's probably going to cost you a buttload of money. So keep that in mind. But if you need those, it's not too bad. And then a little farther in, and this works for the cities, but they're located in different places. You have your story related companions, and those are ones you can actually have relationships with some of them. You'll notice when it gives you an option to flirt, which ones those are. But also, you're going to have usually a, bo a bar of some kind, usually a place selling booze and drinks and snacks and stuff like that. They're also going to have okay. Hello. different companions that you can get. Citizens won't count. But this one, for example, the fusion system specialist, she's going to bring aeronautic fusion and she's going to bring that into your crew. So if you leave her on your ship, you're going to have options for a little bit of that. Some of the ones that are going to be named bring a little bit more. So she's got shotgun certification, ballistics, and also particle beam weapon systems. So she will bring those benefits to your crew. And if you're willing to work, come aboard. So you can pay them. Or if you've got persuasion, you might be able to persuade them to work for you for a little cheaper. And then you'll be able to bring these people... They hang out on your ships. You can bring them along when you go explore like different areas and stuff, and they'll bring their combat and weapons and stuff with you. So these aren't going to have like deep stories and quests in them, but if you want somebody just who's going to bring a stat bonus to your travels that you have, not a bad way to go. So you're going to have, say, this guy, for example. He's another one. So if he stands up hey, and we talk to him, he's got ballistic weapon systems and missile, we'll mission, uh, missile weapon systems, if I could talk. So if you're into space combat, but you don't want to really spec into these two, he can bring some nice benefits to you, though. Damn. So keep that in mind, and they're going to have all of your different people that you've got in all of the different, like, space Howdy. forts and things. You're going to see a bunch of different variations of characters, stat boosts, levels of stat boosts. So early on, your companion may be able to do a little, little less than some you find later on with like way more stats or just different stats that are going to bring to what you're going for. So companions, typically you're going to find them in the bar or kind of pub area of each of the main spaceports. So if you need extra people hanging out with you, this is where you find them. Now here in New Atlantis is where you're going to interact with a lot of your main quests. There's a couple that you'll go to other destinations for. And if you're wondering in how to tackle the game, a lot of it is really up to you. I will tell you that. The game gives you a lot of freedom to go about the quests you want to, the side quests, or other things of that nature. Side quests are cool, but where you're going to get a large amount of experience, unique like legendary weapons, um, just awesome story moments, it's going to be your main quest. And again, I'm not going to go in there because I don't want to spoil anything. Your main quest with Constellation, and then anything related to factions. All of those quests are the, a lot of the best ones. Now, there's some cool side quests with some very interesting choice moments as well. So don't sleep on the miscellaneous side quests because some of those really are definitely worth the journey to kind of see how you're going to take it. But overall, I will say the main quest is, is going to be what you start on. And the end of the main quest is what's going to roll the credits and take you into New Game Plus. It's going to be where that goes. The faction quests, though are where a lot of the main course is going to reside as well. So don't sleep on those. So my recommendation is do a bit of both of those. If you do a hundred side quests, that's up to you. But if you do like some of the main quests, one of like a good chunk of one of the factions, then some more of the main quests, then maybe another good chunk of the faction, then more of the main quest, and then maybe finish up a faction quest. It's probably gonna kind of break up your experience in the game in a bit more of a favorable way. I don't recommend just mainlining the Constellation quest and skipping everything else because you will miss a lot. 
Depends on how much time you want into the game, but I will tell you, the more you put into the main quests and the faction quests, the more that you're probably going to get out of this game. And that's also where a lot of your experience and monetary funds are going to come from, are those bigger moments. So without spoiling anything, that's the best way I can describe that to you, is the main quests and the faction quests will kind of give you a lot more options in your journey. And then if you go into New Game Plus, you're going to be able to take your skills that you've unlocked with you, and then you can make a bunch of different decisions and kind of do whatever you want. But again, your first time through, it's kind of my recommendation, but you can take my recommendation, completely throw it out the window and play however you want to. That's just from my hours that I've put in. Again, your mileage will completely vary probably on the choices that you make and which quests you want to partake in. Maybe one faction doesn't seem cool. You can skip that one completely too. That's up to you. But that's just like kind of my feeling of how you want to do this one. Don't, I mean, I can spend an hour or two or 12 in the shipbuilder as well. But the shipbuilder is a little more late game and you'll have a lot more freedom in the shipbuilder as you unlock some of those shipbuilding skills that you can get. And then also have you more money to tinker with. So that's just kind of my general recommendation of kind of a process to have a, a better experience in the game is tackling those things and then if you got a cool side quest you wanted to go do and you get a squirrel distraction moment be like squirrel shiny object do a couple of those too but don't forget about you know come back to some of those main and faction quests to, to at least slowly bump the whole progress forward but you know enjoy all the other stuff that happens too that's part of the game if you get distracted building an outpost on another planet and you know you've got an outpost and it's making you like resources and stuff like that that you can tinker with that's kind of one of those things. I built a outpost here, very basic, got it started. And if you're looking for the outpost, it's gonna be this icon. So I can actually see if I come back here, I've got my outpost sitting right there that I can come back, check on, put some work in, maybe get some resources and maybe work on one of my random side quests that's available too. So outposts and shipbuilding, definitely gonna be a little later in the game. You know, there's some deep diving that you can do in those, but the main quests will allow you to have a lot more fun with those as opposed to trying to tinker with stuff while you're broke and haven't unlocked a lot of stuff. So just general recommendations, but again, play how you want. So the final thing to mention is lock picking, and this is gonna be an optional skill for some people, but I ran into it so many times um, I know you could probably go without it. You just may skip over this entire mini game completely, but I will tell you for me, it was one of those that became very handy in a lot of places. And I can tell you some of the stuff you unlock, you're going to find like a few credits, but there's occasional moments you open a door, you find a weapon crate, and I probably found a legendary weapon or at least many rare ones by doing that. Now, one, if you lean into the security thing, you can actually for one, it, access advanced expert and master level locks if you don't you can't even touch those you can basically just mess with novice um and then the benefit of the second rank master is nice for three four is actually one that i probably would kind of do just because i lean so far into it but even if you just get to three you can mess with master but two rings now turn blue when the pick can be slotted so let me show you what that means so this is an extraction site that i can actually go into so I literally landed on a destination, came down in here, and it's an abandoned outpost. There's a few people outside. I honestly could not do anything in the interior of this place that's all underground if I didn't have lockpicking. So you would miss out on just some places that you wouldn't do. That's why I think it's a useful thing, but some people would be like, I don't care. I'm just going to do all the main quests and skip all this stuff. But a couple things when it comes to lockpicking in and of itself. Now, the blue rings, as you can kind of see, this is a singular node. And pretty much all you're doing is always lining up these little dashes with the breaks. So you can see this one here has these two dashes. And you'll notice the only blue ring is that second one in. Now, there's multiple ways that you could line it up, potentially. Sometimes there's only one. And without the blue ring, what you basically have to do is plan all four levels. So if you've got the outer ring that's white, you've got the inner second ring, like this blue ring and the fourth one in the inside, this works on both of those. And you need to be able to go through and have a plan where all of these work on at least some of the levels. Now on master, there's a lot of these. When it's novice, there's much easier stuff to do. But each time you use one of these like little like picks, and if you get it right and you get all the way to the bottom, you don't have to use another lock pick, which is called a digit pick. But if you need to undo something, like you get two or three levels in 
every single one of these that you have to undo counts for a digipick. So one thing is if you get multiple tiers in and you're just like, man, I messed this up. It's easier to back out, lose one key, and then come back in and try again as opposed to undoing four or five moves. I promise you it's much more efficient because the digi keys, while I have a lot, if I go to vendors, I buy every single one that I can. And then I literally, I explore and resource grab like a lot, which probably has taken me some time, but I have a lot of these things. But I will tell you early on, sometimes you're not around them. If there's literally any vendor I access, any trade port, any trade authority area, if there is a reasonable vendor who might sell some miscellaneous stuff, I always look for digipix. But also if you like go three or four of these things in and you've got to undo seven moves and I waste seven digipix, I wouldn't do that. I would back out, drop the one and then start over. But this is also why lock picking works well. This one that is just these two on the outside, it only works on the outer ring and then the second ring. And for me, it just made it easier. You can do it without it. You can sit here and go through every one of them. Make sure you've got a plan. You can probably get a little notebook if you want to. However you want to tackle this, like this one only goes on the second level. So I can see it's like it doesn't fit there. Doesn't quite fit there. So it's like, there's only so many places this thing's gonna work. So, all right, I know this one is second level only and it's gonna go right there. So also on the second level, I need one with a single dash here and then one, two, three. So actually I know this one is gonna go right here, but also since it's the only one that fits that second ring, it makes it a lot easier. That's why at least two points will get you access to everything but master, but having these blue rings kind of give you a little guidance will speed up your lock pick processing a lot. Unless you just wanna sit here and like, you know, really take your time on every one of them. That's fine. But the blue rings alone sped this process up a lot. And I actually got to a point where I kind of enjoyed the mini game, kind of really powering through it. But this, for example, since it's a master door, I would not even be able to explore whatever else is in this outpost without lock picking. So for me, it's just something I got a lot of use out of and something that has a door that is master. I bet you there's a good reward in here. Now I'm not going to go record and show you the whole cleaning out, but I bet you it's there. So that pretty much wraps up my tips video for you guys. I tried to again do this with very minimal spoilers. That's why you saw me running around a dusty planet and showing you basic random outposts. But I'm not here to mess with factions or stories or anything of that nature. Um, there's a lot that you guys are going to get to experience on your own. And I hope you enjoy it. I'm probably going to do some couple other guide videos over certain systems. Shipbuilding I think I can talk a decent amount about because I've got enough money to tinker. Outposts I haven't done as much with. So let me know what you guys want to see. And also, if you're playing along and you see this video a little later, and maybe I forgot a couple tips or something, throw those down in the comments. But if you enjoyed the video, drop a like below. If you're enjoying my content and anything that I cover, because I'm going to be covering a lot of Destiny stuff, but also going to be covering a lot of variety stuff going forward, hit that subscribe button, hit the alert bell. It's a nice way to support the channel for free. If you want to find me on Twitter, Twitch at Cibantis. And if you want to go a little farther, you can join as a YouTube member, or you can also find my Patreon. But thank you to everybody for just watching the video. Hopefully you learned something, and good, uh, good luck out there traveling the stars.